viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Afghan women unending misery continues unabated under Taliban rule. Anti-terror operations continue in Jammu and Kashmir. And Pakistan's ISI fueling pro-Khalistan sentiments after Indian Army tightens crews on terror in Kashmir. Let's begin the show with Afghanistan, where over the past 12 months, human rights violations against women and girls have mounted steadily. Despite that women would be allowed to exercise their rights within Sharia law, including the right to work and to study, the Taliban has systematically excluded women and girls from public life. Recently, a shocking footage has emerged from Afghanistan that shows a Taliban official beating Afghan students who were protesting their rights to education after being denied entry to a university for not wearing a burqa. A report. Since resting power in August last year, the Taliban have been clamping down on women's rights by barring them access to education and public spaces. In a recent incident, Shocking footage has surfaced from Afghanistan in which a Taliban official has been seen beating Afghan female students who were protesting their rights to education after being denied from entering a university for not wearing a burqa. Videos posted on social media on October 31st showed vice and virtue personnel of the Taliban government assaulting female students outside the gates of the Badakhshah University. In the video posted, one of the Taliban government's guards can be seen chasing after students with a whip to disperse the crowd, banging on the gates for the authorities to allow them to enter. In Afghanistan over the last two decades, girls and women gained increased access to their rights to education and to full and productive roles in society. Today, sadly, these same women and girls have had these hopes cruelly taken away from them once more. The rollbacks on rights to employment, education, freedom of movement and enjoyment of dignity and freedom from violence have been exacerbated by an economic situation that threatens levels of famine and poverty on an unfathomable scale. Without full participation in public life, women's access to essential services will be even further curtailed. The women of Afghanistan, as well as the countries of the region and beyond, are yearning for stability. But a country cannot become more stable when half its population is excluded from public life and the economy. A few days prior to this incident, a large group of women activists staged a massive protest in front of Kabul University after authorities expelled female students from dormitories for violating rules. Afghanistan is the only country in the world where girls are banned from going to high schools and effectively banned from political participation. Today they have imposed a primitive government with harsh rules erasing centuries of female progress. The hardliners have denied millions of girls the right to education by tens of thousands of women from government shops and outlawed their business and various sorts of activism. A recent analysis by the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, found that prohibiting girls from attending high school also has a financial cost, costing the nation 2.5% of its annual GDP. According to UNICEF, if the 3 million girls in the current cohort finished secondary school and entered the workforce, the Afghan economy would grow by at least 5.4 billion US dollars. However, it appears that under the current circumstances, Taliban group's contribution is headed towards zero. برای ازی که برای طالبا بفهمانیم که زنان این پیکری از جامعه است و نیاز مبرم است برای زنان افغانستان و زنان باید درس بخوانند و زنان باید کار کنند مطالعه داشته باشند چون زن با سواد باعث میشه که جامعه بهتر داشته باشه جامعه آرامتر داشته باشه هرچی آگاهی بالاتر بروه و فکر میکنم خوشونت ها کمتر میشن و جنگ کمتر خواهد بود به او خاطر کتاب خانه را ایجاد کرد a century ago, the women in Afghanistan were free. They enjoyed the right to education, right to political participation and the right to movement. 
However, today's Afghan women no longer even have the right to life. Notably, the situation of human rights in the war-torn country has worsened since the Taliban came to power in August last year. As per the recent report of Gallup's Law and Order Index, Afghanistan has been ranked as the least secure country in the world. Furthermore, the country remains in the grip of deep humanitarian and economic crisis. Acute malnutrition is spiking across the country and 95% of households have been experiencing insufficient food consumption and food insecurity. People in Afghanistan had hoped for peace and an end to conflicts to better their lot, but not at the expense of losing the accomplishments of the previous 20 years. It seems that Afghanistan's seemingly never-ending war is far from over. Pakistan is using all its state mercenaries to provoke anti-India sentiments. To disrupt peace and harmony in the largest democracy of the world, the notorious intelligence agency of Pakistan, the ISI, is attempting to promote separatism and terrorism in Punjab state. Through various means and strategies, Islamabad tries to instigate Sikh youth in India and abroad with the objective of spoiling their future. pro Khalistan terrorist groups have infiltrated Gurudwaras in Pakistan's Lahore under a new game plan in a bid to promote extremism in the Indian Sikh community against Hindus and the central government. According to intelligence inputs, the alleged hijacker of the Srinagar Lahore flight in 1984 was seen meeting Akal Takht Jathidar Jiani Harpeet Singh in Panja Sahib Gurudwara in Lahore. Pakistan's game plan as such is to keep Khalistani extremists in Gurudwaras in Lahore so that they can radicalize Sikh devotees. Intelligence Bureau of India has issued alert and warnings to other intelligence agencies and security agencies within the country, telling them that Pakistani ISI is up to nefarious activities once again. They have formed Lakshay Khalsa, whose aim is to create chaos and mayhem in Punjab. They are recruiting Afghan terrorists for the said purpose. Under the circumstances, Pakistan has to be brought to book. India has to up the ante. We carried out a surgical strike after the attack on Uri and after the attack on Pulwama, Balakot like strike. Something similar ought to be done to ensure that Pakistan stops acting in a hostile manner against India. Park backed Khalistan elements are continuously attempting to disturb Punjab's peace, stability, and communal harmony. Pro Khalistan sympathizers believe that one day their time will come and the ISI and Pakistani establishment are trying their best to make that happen. Islamabad's role in supporting the Khalistan movement is a direct consequence of 1971 breakup of Pakistan when Bangladesh was formed out of East Pakistan with the help of the Indian Armed Forces. Following 1971 war, the only thing Pakistan wanted was revenge and more specifically, bleeding India with a thousand cuts. Thus, post-1971 Pakistan's policy and strategical measures underwent transition and became entirely dedicated to hurt India along with religious, political and ethnic lines. In this way, the foundation of the Khalistan movement was laid. The ethnic cleansing, forced conversions, targeted attacks on Gurudwaras have reduced the Sikhs, Hindus and the Christians into a small fraction of a community in Pakistan. Yet Pakistan assumes to be the champion of Khalistani causes and support the Khalistan militancy. Interestingly, Khalistani organizations are also asking for support from Pakistan, where Sikhs who are in the minority often face atrocities at the hands of the majority population. What is even more interesting is that when these organizations release the proposed map of Khalistan, they conveniently skip adding parts of Punjab that are in Pakistan, where many major shrines of the Sikh religion are located. The Khalistani groups supported by Pakistan 
lack a sense of geography as well as history. If their objective was to create an independent Khalistan, then major portion of Pakistan, Punjab province would also be included in the same. However, they try to portray the map of the so-called Khalistan, which includes parts of Indian Punjab only. The Khalistanis, by working for India's enemies, are committing a crime that goes against their gurus, who work to unite India and their own kith and kin. They have done enough damage to the legacy of their gurus. Pakistan, on the other hand, has been eliminating its Sikh population for decades through killings, rapes, abductions, and forced marriages of young women. Yet it is funding and fueling Khalistani terrorism and separatist movement globally to achieve its sinister plans to break up India. Frustrated by its failures at fomenting trouble in India, Pakistan is using all tricks in its book to unleash violence in the country. But the vigilant Indian security forces have been successfully throwing all its mischievous agendas. In the latest operation, security forces in Jammu and Kashmir eliminated four park back terrorists in two separate encounters. A report. Pakistan is enraged by the stability and progress in Jammu and Kashmir and does all in its power to sow instability and violence in the region. However, the Indian security forces are carrying out a series of operations to dismantle the network of park back terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Recently, terrorist organizations operating in the valley just suffered a severe blow. On November 1, security forces neutralized four park back terrorists in two separate encounters in Jammu and Kashmir. Three of them, including one Lashkar commander, were killed in Avantipura, while one terrorist was killed in Anantanag district. An information concerning the presence of terrorists in the region was sent to a joint team of police and security services. After which, security forces launched a cordon and a search operation in the area. The police team recovered arms and ammunition from the site of the encounter. Pakistan is angry because of the stability and progress that is being made in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And therefore it is doing everything in its power uh, to sow the seeds of instability and violence in the region. A news comes that one or two terrorists get neutralized and their strength goes down. However, uh, what happens is that Again, they try and show their presence by uh, trying to attack some soft target like some of the police people who were on leave. They have been attacked and they have been killed. They, uh, in one case, uh, they uh, uh, threw a grenade uh, at a security post. Uh, in another case, uh, they tried to threaten people who were going in for music, etc. So, uh, they are basically targeting the soft targets but they do not have the capability to carry out any worthwhile major attacks. The situation in Jammu and Kashmir has shown a considerable improvement, symbolizing a return to normalcy. The security environment has considerably shifted in the favor of security forces. The terrorists have suffered heavy attrition and simultaneously have not been able to replenish their dwindling cadres due to the effectiveness of the counter-infiltration measures. As per the report of Ministry of Home Affairs, there has been a substantial decline in the number of active terrorists in the region from 184 in 2021 to 134 in 2022. Of the 134 active terrorists, 51 are local terrorists and 83 are foreign terrorists. The terrorists belong to terror outfits like Lashkar-e Taiba, its offshoot the Resistance Front, Jaish-e Muhammad, and Hezbollah Mujahideen. Today, it is uh, it is appreciated that the number of terrorists still operating 
in the Kashmir Valley is in the region of 150 to 200 and their number will keep on decreasing. A Pakistani army is not able to support them with the help of artillery fire etc because Pakistan itself is in deep trouble. Despite all the embarrassment and name calling at various global forums, Pakistan continues to use terrorism as an instrument of its state policy. In a sophisticated world where the other countries are looking forward to establishing peace, harmony and developing new technologies for the advancement of the world's settlement, Pakistan's stale policy of terrorism is causing violence and is creating an environment of distrust in the world. Residents settled near the border areas are living in constant fear due to frequent firing along the border from the Pakistani side. Pakistani army generals, who are the real masterminds behind most of the terrorism across the globe, believe that the world won't notice their devious plans. But to their surprise, not only all of their diabolic activities are being monitored, but being given a befitting reply by the Indian forces. Eight years ago, some terrorists attacked Army Public School in Peshawar in Pakistan and killed dozens of children. Recently, an activist has claimed that though the shootings were carried out by terrorists, the attack was facilitated by the Pakistani military establishment. A report. On December 16, 2014, six terrorists associated with Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan attacked the Army Public School in the northwestern city of Peshawar. 147 people, including 132 children, were killed in the attack. Fazal Khan, a human rights activist, lawyer and the founding member of the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, joined EFSAS director Junaid Qureshi in Amsterdam for the latest redemption of EFSAS interview series. Mr. Khan's son was also killed in the attack. The killing of Mr. Khan's son has driven his continued focus on human rights activism and his pursuit of justice for the children killed during the 2014 massacre. Mr. Khan has argued that the shootings were carried out by terrorists but facilitated by the Pakistani military establishment. He bases this claim on assailants not targeting military personnel and established school schedules not being followed by the school resulting in the physical concentration of children in the spaces where shootings would take place. 2014-16 December incident, which took place in Peshawar and uh, unfortunately in that uh, terrorist attack, I have lost uh, my son uh, who was a grade 9 student, uh, age 15, along with uh, almost 147 uh, other school kids and uh, some teaching staff. Uh, it was uh, like a natural that uh, uh, things like that happens in those days in Pakistan. Uh, across the border, I would say, uh, those uh, terrorism, but we haven't seen it uh, with that depth because once, uh, when, when it comes to your own home, mm -hmm. when something happens to, to yourself in person, then naturally, you have more feeling. Mr. Khan suggested that Pakistani security institutions facilitated the attack to ensure continued U.S. security aid at a time when support in Washington was wavering, condemning the victims of the attacks to being collateral damage. The Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan claimed responsibility for the massacre yet specifically established military courts failed to prosecute relevant TTP leaders. Authorities held a TTP spokesman in a safe house before allowing him to leave Pakistan for Turkey. There are eyewitnesses who have seen uh, uh, many things which should not be like there. Uh, the, the most important thing is that uh, if you have heard about it, that uh, there was uh, a first aid training going on in the school on that day when the terrorists entered uh, and attacked the school. Un uh, unfortunately, and uh, uh, that uh, first aid training was not supposed to be there 
rather I would say never there. Like uh, you know, they have staged this first aid training, and the first aid training was staged by a so-called major of the army. Pakistan has always been involved in terrorism through the backing of various designated terrorist organizations. Pakistan Army and Intelligence Agency have also been frequently accused by various countries for the involvement in a variety of terrorist activities in both its local region of South Asia and beyond. Pakistan has, however, always denied providing safe haven to any terrorist group. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsaatnain.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.